Here we are on Canyon Road, and we're getting ready to start another After Hours program here at Vivo Contemporary. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to look in the camera. It's a little bright. And we're going to have three artists tonight. We're going to do a quick uh, couple of create some dialogue with the artists and learn more about their work and their process. And then we're going to have a question and answer session. Uh, this is centered around the Once Upon a Time show here at Vivo. And we're going to get started in just a second here. I want to make a few announcements. Uh, our next event is going to be on October 20th during the paint out, the big Canyon Road paint out. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to have some artists here that are going to have uh, their studio kind of brought into the gallery. They're going to have their stuff set up, they're going to be explaining their process, and then we're going to have a special nighttime event also on October 20th with the Tea Bag Project and Laser, uh, one of Vivo's longtime uh, artists. She's going to show her latest line of wearable art. So this is something on October 20th, all day and into the night. Come on down to Vivo and we will see you there. Now we're going to get started with Patricia Pierce. Here she is. The one and only. Hello, Patricia. I'm going to say a few things about you, if you don't mind. She's going to be talking about these works, which are in the, the new show here at Vivo, Once Upon a Time. Patricia, once she uh, was described by an art magazine as being an exclamation point in a sea of commas. And I would say that's pretty much an understatement. I would go. <laughs> I would go with one of those kind of upside down Spanish exclamation points and then maybe a number sign, no. But Patricia has a long time figure in the Santa Fe art scene. She's been a teacher at the community college for 20 years. She's been in Santa Fe for... 1981? Since 1981. So shortly after my birth. <laughs> exactly, me too. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple of questions for Patricia. Uh, about her work. It's going to be pretty straightforward. So, Patricia, when was the moment that you realized you wanted to be an artist? I think my mother said I wiggled around in her room quite rapidly and she knew I was going to do something out of the ordinary. From the time I was born, I'm the oldest of six kids and no, none of my, I always had my own room because none of my siblings would share a room with me. <laughs> and you can imagine why. I slept from early, early, early childhood, I slept three to four hours a night. To this day, I'm still at four hours a night. And uh, I'll just wake up dead one morning, and that'll be the end of it, but it won't be anything long and drug out. I'll just wake up dead. But anyway, my mother put in my room, she put this table, it's low table, and they finally just took me out of the crib because that wasn't working, put a mattress on the floor, and she put a, a kind of a baby gate up, and I had Crayolas, a big overstuffed rocking chair, and a table in my room. From that day forward, I never gave her another minute of grief. I colored on the walls, I painted on the floor. I painted on the bed, I painted everywhere. But she allowed me to get by with it, and as a result, I'm not even intimidated in the slightest today. And as I get closer and closer to 105, uh, you know, I guess I'm doing okay. But I'm most fascinated when I'm burying my work and dating it back. I like it to feel as if it's an, you know, from an archaeological being. So quite fascinates me. Yes, your work is very dark and textured, but yet also very alive and exciting, I would say. I mean, there's, you use all kinds of media, and yet you can tell a Patricia Pierce from a mile away, whether it's a shin or a piece of, you know, burnt wood. So, was it always that way? I mean, were you making assemblage when you were six months old, or was there a moment in your life? There's quite, quite. Where was that crystallizing moment where you got to this, to this kind day. of work? Yes. Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it changes for me like daily. I'm fascinated by the alchemy of change and decay and the aging process of things. Uh, I, like, as I said, I love to bury things and, and see what the earth does to it. I work with a body of bronze as well as these are, 
This is a mixed media, mixed media printmaking. You guys kind of forgive me. I've been at work since 7.30 this morning, so I'm speaking to students. So if my tongue gets tied, please just try to bear with me as I get the knot out. But uh, when I do bronze work, I bury it in the compost pile. And I let the, that, the heat of the compost pile age it, bring the beauty of it out. I do that with books as well. I bury them. Not always in the compost pile, but I'll bury it in a dirt pile or I'll lay them out on the side of a hill. Now, these are, are happening, these are old book pages. I inherited 500 law books. What do you do with 500 outdated law books? You know? So I thought, okay, I'm gonna make them work. Not only do I force my students to do one a semester, they have to take a book a semester, but I also take, I try to average 10 books in a 16 week period to some will be good, some will be okay, some will be amazing, some will be absolutely God forsaken the awful. But these are pages from these small books. So they're kind of fragile, but I put them, I start what I call an alternative printmaking process by putting them in a dye bag. They stay, I move them back and forth to the different colors for about a 75 day period. Anywhere from 45 to 75 before they reach the aging process that I like for them. So once those were developed, I dry them and let them, and I take them down so they, and put them under pressure so they die, dry nice and flat. And then I typically use a, a body of collage work that I've had stuffed in a box, you know, that didn't quite make the grade, but sort of it got a new life as it was combined. Now this particular group, there's six in the series, all in the same color palette, and I call them fragments one, two, and three, just as a short way to give them a title, but their real title is like fragment, there we go, tied up. Fragment three from site 27591, dig 945. So to me, they're things I've taken out of archeological digs. They're old pieces of fresco and paper and stuff that are found in these archeological dwellings. Did well, I answer that for you or did I go you beyond? You answered the next five questions. <laughs> so, that's good news for you because I know you you're tired. I like control. I'm um, a control freak. Last thing, yeah. you can make, you don't have to work on this too hard, but funny or scary story about making art or uh, displaying funny or art. Scary st oh, a funny story. I work with assemblage as well, so I use a, a body of found object, wood, different things like that. So I've done these elongated assemblages that are called dwellings. And that's where the explanation mark in the sea of commas came from when I introduced that body at the Linda Durham Gallery many years ago. And uh, we had it, some of them in this gallery. And this little 10 year old kid was, he was really inquisitive and looking around and just dying. He stopped dead in his tracks when he got to this one. And you could tell he was about to touch it. His mother was on um, pins and needles because she didn't want to discourage his curiosity and his fascination with it but she think, oh my god don't touch it and he said mommy 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 come quick she said oh my god so she went running over there and he said it's a harry potter house <laughs> you got it dude. you got it so he picked up on it because it was funky it was slightly Uneven, and that was a deliberate thing because I didn't want all these perfectly placed things, you know, stacked up. So that was my, one of my funniest experiences with my art. Yep. Thank you, Patricia. Bravo. Thank you. Do we have any questions? If anybody, we have a yes, few I'm minutes for a, for a couple question questions. Yes. Anyone? Well, I'll ask your so question, so Patricia. I really love coming to these things at Vivo Contemporary, these, especially these, after, these new after our events that you started. How can I support this? Is there a, like a small publication that you put out every year that I could perhaps purchase for a small fee? <laughs> oh, most definitely. <laughs> 
We actually don't produce many publications, but one we do is we have a poetry and art uh, section every year, and it's usually in April, which is Poetry Month. And we work with poets in the area, and the poets write about our work. They pick a piece and write, and we have a full, almost month worth of events. And we sell a little book that we put out for a grand total of $10, is that correct? Yes. Very good. It's so, a heck of a lot of content for the dollar, I can tell you oh, right now. most definitely. Well, thank you, Patricia. Well, you are so welcome. We're gonna move over here. So this is my work. I've uh, a new Santa Fe in. My name is Warren Keating, and I've only been here three years. Um, I'm originally from New Orleans, but I lived and spent my uh, time, did my time in Los Angeles for many, many years. Went there to college and forgot to leave, but happily I'm here now. Um, my work, I've been painting kind of like Patricia from when I was a little, little kid. In fact, ironically, I really don't really play this up, but I could for publicity pur pur purposes. I could walk when I was a like 12 to 16. So I could like say, oh, I could walk. So now I do paintings about people walking, but I'm gonna save that for another press release. And that, during that time is when I went from being a kid who doodled to getting really serious about painting and drawing. And you know, it just became a world of escape because I couldn't do anything else. Um, so I went to college, I studied in college. and was very serious, was a landscape painter for many years. Um, in college, I was discouraged from doing realistic painting because it was the, late 80s, early 90s, and it just was the last thing people did. So I sort of made it my mission to keep figurative painting, you know, relevant. So figure out a way to make it, you know, in a 21st context, not some trite thing that was from the 18th century. So that's kind of my, my gig. I'm trying to, you know, I want to force figurative painting on the world. So about nine years ago, um, after spending a lot of time in Mexico doing landscapes and whatnot, I was in Paris on an anniversary trip with my wife, waiting for her to get ready. And I had a, <laughs> had a new video camera, and I, um, I guess I'll put my artwork behind me. Had a new video camera, and I was playing with it, got some footage of some people walking in and out of a consulate across the street. And it was, you know, from my balcony, so it was overhead. Didn't really think about it very much. Then started playing with it about six months later. One thing led to another. The stuff sold a lot more quickly than anything else I had done. And, um, but the funny thing was, from the video, I was kind of finishing the work, like making everything perfectly realistic, and then um, you know, inventing the stuff that was missing. But the video had a, a movement and a texture to it that after six or seven paintings, I started to emulate, and it got me on this track. Um, so let me read one of my questions. Unusual materials or techniques? Well, I use every kind of video camera imaginable. In fact, now I use drones. Um, this painting almost got me arrested three or four months ago when I was getting the reference. Um, I had full permission from the Native Americans, but the ranger didn't know that, and there was this whole big thing. Um, so unusual, you know, capturing the reference is like at least half my process, so people don't realize that. The painting part is kind of really the easy part. He actually will not admit what his job was prior to becoming a painter because it was so undercover and he spied on so many people from so yeah. many balconies that he can't talk to pretty about it. Funny or scary story? I got a million of them. Um, scary story. You know, people never look up. I mean, even like this person was the first person I captured with a drone and they didn't even, and it's a loud thing, you know, and they never looked up. Usually I'm just hanging over a bridge or something, you know, with people walking on a, on a bike path or whatever. One time, a couple of guys looked up, don't mean to be judgmental, but I think they were drug dealers. <laughs> because I had a camera, they were kind of like, hey, you can't put that camera, you know, yelling at me. And then there was a lot of like rigmarole for them to get to where I was, so I, and it was 4th of July in Santa Monica. So I just kind of got lost in the crowd for about 10 minutes. So that was kind of a scary, and I made a big painting of those guys yelling at me. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a scary and a funny story. Um, Did the sheriff's office buy that painting? The sheriff? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so. That was the mug shot, sweetheart. I'm going to move on to our next. Oh, questions. Who has a question? Does anyone have questions? 
You can make something well, up. Well, I love it. People always ask ask me, and I want to have you maybe make a comment. Maybe you met, did, and I didn't hear it. But they're saying that that pixelated look, you know, and I said, well, that's how he makes the motion. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, the challenge is to take a right angle mark or in a, in a linear mark and, you know, make it about curves. You know, so I basically have, you know, 75% of the painting being these kind of angular marks and then I'll find a, a curve, you know, something to contrast. You know, 70% uh, of the painting is in motion and then I'll find a place for it to be stable. Those, that's what I'm working with is the well, you know, moving and the still, the straight and the curve. You know, the straight lines really work with the canvas because the canvas is square or rectangular. So I, I really like that. But thanks for the question. All right, we are going to move on, people. Moving on. Okay, yes, we're going this way. We're going over to Norma Alonzo's work, who has been in Santa Fe for 12 years. But with Vivo. But with Vivo very recently. Like two months. <laughs> we're very happy to. Um, maybe go over here. You're a little bit in the dark. Oh, right here? Yeah. The, okay. Okay. So, new to Vivo. A smash hit. Everybody loves Norma's work. Well, you, thank you yes, very much. You're a personal favorite of mine. Oh, it's like, that's so sweet. It's like, yeah, because I love Deben Corn. I mean, that's like one of my big heroes. So immediately I loved your work. Well, what happened to me was I, uh, many, many years ago when I started painting, 25 years ago or so, I fell in love with Batiste, first of all, and I started looking at the masters and I wanted to learn about, you know, art in general. And Matisse was the guy. And so the color came from Matisse and the line came from Diebenkorn. That's the connection. Oh, interesting. And interestingly enough, Diebenkorn was also a student of Matisse. So that when you look at any book um, on Diebenkorn, you'll find a reference to Matisse. And so I kind of feel like those are the two guys, the two main guys that have been influenced my work. And so you'll see a lot of color, you'll see a lot of texture in terms of the paint application, you'll see a lot of line work. And as a former interior designer, um, I wanted to continue with the, my love for line, and I wanted to give it the freedom and the passion of what I see here in New Mexico. So when I first moved here to New Mexico, I wound up hiking the trails and going up and looking at all the arroyos. And what fascinated me the most is just the way that you could look at the, the hillside and see these cliff dwellings perhaps in the distance or something, or you could see uh, you know, the, the, the ladders coming in, the play of the water seeping through and creating these arroyos. And so that's kind of what I've done. That's my, so I've combined a, a love for landscaping, landscape painting and a love for the color in New Mexico. So, did you start out as an abstract painter? Did I started evolve? off as a landscape painter. I, many years ago, when I first started painting, I fell in love with the landscape. And <clears throat> my mentor, Richard Lees, once said, if you can take the ultimate abstract, which is a landscape, and turn it into something that's cohesive and that reads, you've done it. And so from that point on, I just said I had the freedom to investigate anything I wanted. I could take anything and make it from me and turn it into something that would read. And to me, this reads like cliff, dwellings, you know, a hillside cut. So that's, that's my New Mexico painting. <laughs> and I have others that I've done, but I like to break up the terrain. I like to see what I can what I can do with the land and give it the color that it deserves and the beauty and the richness that the land gives to, back to me whenever I go for my walks with my dogs. And, and again, I'm going back to Matisse and I'm going back to Diebenkorn. And in the beginning when I started painting, I used to think, I don't want to be called Diebenkorn-like. I don't want to be called Matisse-like. But what I've realized is that it's okay because it's me. It's all my work. This is me. Yeah. It's not them. And every time I go to the easel and I create something, um, I, I always feel the, the liberty to do whatever I want to do. And I, that resonates in my work. So each work is distinctly different, but distinctly me. So that's, that's Definitely. It. I mean, you got a definite distinct style, way that you work on the, you know, 
with line and color. Now, but you mentioned your teacher. He, I, you told me early he taught you to be honest and work from the gut. Yeah, um, I used to, when I did complain to him and I would say, oh, you know, people are saying my work is this or my work is that, and he said, you know, just paint for your gut, from your gut, and whatever comes out, that is going to be you. And ever since that time, I've always felt like, I hear his voice, and I keep hearing him say to me, be honest, be truthful, paint with your whole being, paint with what you're feeling. And so when I go to the easel to paint, I don't come with a planned idea, I don't start with any of that. I come with whatever is in me at that moment, and that's what I address each and every time I paint, without a doubt. And so when I sit and stand in front of an easel, brand new, I don't feel a concern or a worry or any of that. I just feel this, this need to just put something down and I let it be. So whatever's there is gonna come out and I trust that. That's me. <laughs> and you were worried about being able to talk about your work. You're doing a fantastic job. I'm oh, sure thank you. you very much. So you were telling me a story earlier. I'm trying to remember the cue. I was supposed to give you a cue. A story. What was that? Yeah, but you were telling me something earlier. It wasn't quite funny or scary, and now I'm, it's, I should have wrote it. Do you remember what it was? No, I don't, because I'm on the spot. No, I oh, don't. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Anyway, um, but do you have anything funny, scary? No. Oh, wow, what was it? We were, oh. That's, that's okay. So, oh, I know what it is. Oh. About your social media. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, in the last year, I've done in, in, on Instagram, and in the last year, um, and I didn't even do Facebook before that, and I now have about 7,000 followers, and, and I just posted a, a couple of paintings from the gallery that I was showing, and I got like 3,000 likes on it, which is just amazing to me, and it's great that I get to get... But you were saying it was, there was an unusual kind of byproduct well, like, well, that people were... Yeah, and that's what I'm kind of go, uh, getting up to, is that with so many people, and following me now, I feel this obligation to sort of kind of talk about my work a little bit. And used to, I used to just post and just let it be, but now I'll say something like, this painting was an absolute struggle, why am I doing this, or whatever it might be, or um, I'm happy, I, I'll show my... the. the the work for the week and what I had to go through to get there. And I might even throw out a question like, do you think it's done? And the comments I get are having to do more about their own work and their own um, <clears throat> path. And I found myself mentoring people that are following me and it's kind of a new experience and I'm not used to it, but I kind of like it because it, it, it helps me evolve a little more as a person that's maturing <laughs> in, in their work and their approach to um, art, the art world in general. And I like the connection because it's such a solitary thing to be painting alone in your studio day after day after day. And then to be able to just connect in a, in a word or two with someone that's doing something clear across the globe, and they're also going through the same things you're going through. It's, it's, it just reinforces that that sense that this is about all of us here. So that's it. Do we have any questions? Well, one of the comments I want to make it feels really alive. The work does, and the comments I get from people when they're in the gallery working is. So alive, it's so alive, it's so, and many people have said to me, it has a childlike sophistication, and that's kind of, to me, I think that's charming. Well, I think that that's where I am right now. I think it, it, as I'm getting older, it's sort of like I'm acknowledging the fact that I am getting older, but I'm also acknowledging the fact that I'm much better than I was before, and I look at life entirely different than I did before. So the things that mattered before just don't matter, and the things that I find are interesting and lovely about the world I see around me, I like to put in my work. And so there, that's where the color comes from. It certainly shows. Yeah. So I, think yeah. that I can't live without color now. Yeah. And you know what? It didn't happen until I moved to New Mexico. Well, I always aspire to be, you know, 
to make art that looked like a three-year-old did it. I mean, that is the ultimate. I mean, that really is the ultimate compliment to me. But um, I want to give a shout out to everybody. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. We're doing a whole bunch of stuff on the, uh, the paint out, October 20th. We're going to do stuff during the day. We're going to have an artist in. We're going to not do the usual, you know, I've done it. Some other artists have done it where we're outside painting. We're trying to mix it up. So we're going to have, a, 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 we're going to bring artist studio inside the gallery. We're going to have an artist here with a table set up with their materials and they're going to have uh, a couple of times during the day where they'll be here to talk about how they work and how they use their material. We're going to have two artists and then we're going to have a night program where, um, I don't know who's, if anyone's familiar with Ann Laser's tea bag art, but the, um, she has some wearable art and we're looking through the scarves. She's going to do a show of the newest wearable art, 5 p.m. during paint out, October 20th. Please go to our website. Check out the calendar of what we're doing. We're really, we really appreciate you guys supporting the after hours. And There's a coming up on the 17th of November. Yes, we're doing a music program in November for after hours. There's a little postcard over there if you want to give us your email and say after hours, and we'll make sure that you get an email. I mean, if you're local and you want to come out and do some kind of interesting art stuff, we're going we to also do films. We'll be having some, poet, some poets. Yeah, we're going to do poetry. poetry. We've got a really big, robust program coming up. Thank you all. Hey, See you later. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs>